Well, good morning. So great to see everybody, and we truly appreciate everyone being here this morning and really desire for you to feel a part of our church family here at College Church of Christ. Hopefully you got one of these little handy-dandy communion cups when you came in, and please don't forget to take that with you when you leave. There's trash cans located at the exits. For those of you visiting with us, we advise you to please take one of our Let's Connect cards in the pews and please fill it out and put it in one of the contribution boxes as you leave. And in addition, there's space on the back of the Let's Connect cards for visitors and members to indicate prayer requests, comments, or questions. You can also do this by scanning the QR code on the front of the Let's Connect card and submitting your input online. Again, please put your cards in one of the boxes where you turn in your contribution. And these boxes are located at various places around the building, and we really thank you for taking the time to connect with us this morning. Please also take note of the QR code located on the order of the worship handout, and this will allow you to get access to the entire bulletin that is online. Honor Symposium, we want to welcome, we have a large group of Honor Symposium up there in the balcony, so let's please welcome them. Well, hey, when you, when you guys come to Harding University, please come visit us here at College Church of Christ. We'd love you to be a part of the campus ministry and church as a whole here. We want to celebrate a new sister in Christ. Nevaeh Philpot, daughter of Lola Philpot, was baptized on Friday, July 1st by, by her brother, John. Nevaeh, if you are here, will you please stand so we can celebrate you? It's up there in the back. Here we go. And we, we praise God for that. It never gets old to have a new creation in Christ. Andy and Kayla Pendleton announced the birth of a boy, Marshall Ross, and he was born Sunday, June 26th. Proud siblings are Ella, Ava, and Bryce. Proud grandparents are Danny and Kathy Wood and Uncle Mike Wood. Marshall weighed in at seven pounds, eight ounces. Patrick and Donna Brown would like to announce the arrival of a new grandson, Jack Forbes Beavers, and he was born on Thursday, June 29th to Tessa and Jonathan Beavers of Searcy. Proud, sis proud sister is Georgia. Proud great-grandparents are Carl and Johnny Beavers, Betty Brown, Linda Cox. We do want to let you guys know that we uh, will have the church office will be closed tomorrow, Monday, July 4th, in observance of Independence Day. I wanted to add on one thing here this morning. Charles and Harriet Rayleigh, right here in the front row, they're taking up a whole row there. They're celebrating 60 years of marriage. That is worth celebrating. <laughs> Thank you for being a great example of God's covenant of marriage and what it can be, so thank you for that. Let's worship together this morning. Let's be standing, please. <clears throat> you are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heaven.
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You are the creator of all that is good. You have created mankind in your image and in your likeness. Your desire is to have a relationship with mankind, a relationship you have with your son, Jesus. I pray that we all seek that same relationship, a relationship that would enhance us in leading others to you. I pray that all of us here recognize and have as our king, your son, Jesus. Having him as our king, we learn to imitate his character in all that he does. One of these traits we see in Jesus is that he is a king that shows humility. He shows us this humility in emptying himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself and be becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. This life of humility as king was also shown in his willingness to touch those who needed touching, speaking to those who needed spoken to, feeding those who were hungry, and healing those who needed healing. But most importantly, through his humility, he showed us who you are and in turn showed us how we need to be as well. I ask forgiveness for all our sins. For some of us, it may be many, and for some, it may be few. And some of us may be struggling with complete repentance. There may be times when temptations just keep repeating and we give in to those continual temptations. Maybe, may we be reminded that these sins have been placed on the shoulders of your son when he died on the cross. He took these sins to the grave and we now have a clear path to becoming more and more like you and sin is no longer a problem. We gather as a family to praise you and to worship you. We also gather to encourage each other to love and good deeds. I pray that we take this encouragement and use it to make disciples of Jesus, who in turn make more disciples of Jesus by feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty something to drink, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and visiting those in prison. Knowing that when we do these things, we are also doing it to your son Jesus, and people see you in us. Give us wisdom through your word and your Holy Spirit that we may always live to you and, your, and to give you glory. Father, if it be your will, send your son Jesus quickly. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength. I saw this
This is a, an important weekend for the United States of America as we celebrate, we remember uh, the birthday of our country, July the 4th, uh, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed. And uh, it says in there that uh, these United Colonies declare themselves to be free and independent states. It's right that we would remember that and celebrate that uh, as part of our country's heritage. But at the same time, as Tim Westbrook pointed out in the bulletin this week, we actually have dual citizenship. One, certainly in this country, if we are citizens, and likewise, citizens in the kingdom of God, wherein we are free free from sin, free from the pain and the fear of eternal damnation. And that's because of Jesus, whose death we remember in this communion activity. We are gathered here as citizens in the kingdom of heaven to celebrate, to remember the moment, the act that freed us from sin. Jesus said very clearly, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he also said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So let us celebrate at this time the death of Christ as we remember that act on the cross that gave us freedom from sin. Let's pray. Our Father, we do ask you to bless us, to clear our minds, to help us to focus on the great sacrifice that Christ willingly offered for our sake, the body that was broken on that cross, the body that was hung there and pierced, uh, was given over, became sin for us so that we might be free from the debt that we owed from the rightful reward for our sins. Help us to remember that, to focus on that as we partake of this bread representing that body. We pray through Christ, amen.
passage in the sixth chapter of Romans helps to clarify the relationship between Christ's death and our baptism and our freedom from sin. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can you live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we, if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So all of us who are baptized believers have been freed from sin in an act which is like, parallel, analogous to the death of Christ. We have been cleansed by the waters which represent the blood that he shed on that cross. And as we participate in this communion service and we participate by partaking of the fruit of the vine, we are remembering that blood which cleansed us, freed us from our sins. Let's pray. Father, we are truly grateful that Jesus allowed himself to be hung on the cross and that the blood that flowed from his body cleanses us, frees us from our sins. Father, help us to focus on that wonderful sacrificial act. Help us to live our lives daily in remembrance of that act to honor and to show our humble acceptance of the grace that God gives us, that you have given us. We pray through his name. Amen. This is the time that's designated for us to consider giving back to this church, to God, something that he's given us, some of the material blessings. There are many ways to do that as are listed on the slide. We pray that as each one of us contemplates giving back that which we have only been given stewardship over, that we will remember what great gift was given us. It seems paltry what we return, but in reality, God has given us everything, and we give back only a little bit. Let's pray. Father, open our hearts and help us to be generous and kind. Help, help us to understand that what little we give in no way reflects the magnitude of the gift of Christ on the cross. Help us to remember that each of us is blessed with freedom from sin, uh, hope of eternal life, uh, a way forward 
that was not available until that gift was given us. Father, help us to love and serve in your name. Help us to see ways that we can be better, be more like you each day. We pray through Christ. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 38. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We're going to dismiss our children ages three through first grade while we sing the song. But before we do, if we'd advance to the next slide, we're going to sing Shout Hallelujah. Hallelujah, and you probably know this, means God be praised. God be praised. Let's say that together. Ready? God be praised. So we're singing this song. We're saying shout, God be praised. Let's stand and sing this together. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah. that you have this morning. Owen, excellent job reading our scripture this morning. He's a new Christian, new part of our church, and we're grateful that he was able to help us lead in our service this morning. 
Keep your Bibles open to Luke chapter 19. Years ago when I preached in Texas, Lael and I would occasionally go to a rodeo. I remember once attending the uh, Fort Worth Rodeo, huge national rodeo. At one time, uh, Fort Worth, known as Cowtown, that's Howard Norton's uh, hometown. He wanted to make sure you knew that. <laughs> they had the largest, the world's largest non-motorized parade in, in the world. No cars, no electric cars, no combustion engines. It was all horse-drawn and wagons and walking. But I love the rodeos. We used to attend the Mesquite Rodeo mainly because they had a all-you-can-eat barbecue meal before the rodeo. We were there for the barbecue, not the cows and the bulls and, and all, but, but um, I love the rodeos, and I love the, the energy of that. Uh, the, the opening ceremonies just gets you ready to watch guys on these, uh, you know, bronc busters and, and bulls, and they're, you know, the, 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 you're just ready. And they usually come out, there's someone that comes out in a very majestic horse. Usually that person has the American flag, the Texas flags, the eyes of Texas are playing. I mean, they get you really energetic and patriotic for your country, for your state. But they have all of these cowboys and cowgirls. And sometimes the horses are in formation, sometimes they're running in circles there, some are running around barrels. Maybe one horse will just as fast as he or she can ride that horse. They'll start at one end of the arena and they just go through and out a gate on the other end. And they're showing you the, the majestic nature of their horses, these animals that can do so many things. And you'll see riders performing tricks and things. And it's a, it's a wonderful display of athleticism of both the riders as well as the horses. And then in the midst of all of this pageantry, there's a couple of cowboys that come out and they're riding on donkeys. Now, do you know who those are? That's right, the clowns. They're riding, and that's almost a comical scene as these grown men on these little donkeys and their, their feet are almost dragging the floor, dragging the ground about that far. And, and I mean, it just, it's a laughable scene when you think about it. Well, our text this morning talks about the time that King Jesus rode one of these lowly animals. But it wasn't a comical scene. It wasn't laughable. In fact, at one point in the story, Jesus begins to weep. All four Gospels contain the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. Now, if you read the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would almost get the impression that in the earthly ministry of Jesus, this is the first time he has been in the city of Jerusalem when he started his ministry. If you read John's gospel, it becomes very clear he has been to Jerusalem other times before. But our text this morning comes from Luke chapter 19. Do you remember our, our, our text last week from Luke chapter 9? Jesus has entered one of those Samaritan villages and he was rejected there earlier in the chapter he was transfigured before three of his disciples but Moses and Elijah visit Jesus on that mountain and the thing they're going to discuss with Jesus is the events that are going to occur when he gets to Jerusalem and it's from that point on Luke begins to provide a travel narrative of where Jesus goes from place to place to place. It's in chapter 9 and verse 51 and verse 53. It says he set his face toward Jerusalem. In chapter 13 and verse 22, Jesus is making his, town through, uh, his way through towns and villages journeying towards Jerusalem. Everything he's doing now. Now, he doesn't just run through like he's going from one end of town to the other as fast as he can. No, he's, he has a purpose in each one of these villages. There are people he needs to touch. There are lives he needs to touch. In verse 33 of chapter 9, 
or of, of verse 33 and ver- chapter 13, that one of the Pharisees, and it seems like this Pharisee probably is not an enemy of Jesus, but one of the Pharisees comes to Jesus and says, you need to get out of this region. Herod, the tetrarch, is plotting to take your life. This is when Jesus calls Herod that old wily fox. It's almost that Jesus saying, Herod, he's nothing but a small, insignificant nuisance to me right now. He's nothing. And he keeps going toward Jerusalem. In chapter 17 and verse 11, on the way to Jerusalem, it says, and there again, he's, on, he's in between Samaria and Galilee. This is where he encounters ten lepers and heals them. In chapter 18, we're getting close now, Jesus tells his disciples, verse 11, see, we're going to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. And he begins to explain how he will be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, and he will be caused made uh, to suffer, and he will be put to death. In chapter 19, he enters the city of Jericho. That's where he meets Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree. Verse 11 says, he was near to Jerusalem. And I think as he approaches and he nears Jerusalem, his mind is whirling with Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, those Old Testament Scriptures and prophecies about him. And when he comes to Bethphage and Bethany, now he's only a couple of miles, just a few miles away from the Mount of Olives. Those of you who have ever stood on the Mount of Olives, you know that it provides a very wonderful panoramic view of Jerusalem. So he is, he's very close to that, that time when he will be able to see the city of Jerusalem right there in front of him. He's just a few miles away, and he sends a couple of his disciples into town. He says, you're going to find a donkey, a small donkey. You're going to find it tied up. Take that donkey. And if someone comes out and says, what are you doing? Just use this password. The master needs it. And there will be no questions. And so the disciples go and they find the, the animal just like Jesus said. They take it. They, they were asked. They said, the master has need of it. And so Jesus is making sure that every detail of prophecy is being obeyed so that, so that he has the exact animal in the exact place at the exact time because he has a prophecy in his mind. It comes from Zechariah. Now, I'll give you, you know where Zechariah is? I'll give you three or four minutes to find it if you need. Just go to the very end of your Old Testament, the last book, Malachi, and then go one book back to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Because Jesus must be aware that there will be those that will critically analyze is he the fulfillment of this prophecy or that prophecy or another? It says in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble. Mounted on a donkey. On a colt. The foal of a donkey. It's a very small animal. Jesus knew the Scripture. He knew that Scripture. He knew that he was fulfilling that Scripture. And this was a donkey that had never been ridden before. Now, it's been a long time since I took a class in donkeyology. But I'm going to think it's a safe assumption that a donkey that hasn't been broken or hasn't been trained is going to be very difficult to ride even for a small animal. But Jesus rides it, it seems, easily. Well, as Jesus is following uh, or or nearing uh, Jerusalem, a multitude of followers is with him, uh, Luke tells us. And now he has this wonderful view of Jerusalem, and there's quite a contrast when he enters the city. He's still on the outskirts of of the walls of the city, but as he comes in, there's a contrast 
You know, in Roman society, when a Roman emperor who's been off to battle with his armies, when the general comes home, there's all this pomp and circumstance and ceremony. And you will have the emperor, and with him will be all of his generals and his, his officers. Behind them, a mighty parade of soldiers after soldiers after soldiers. And they have the spoils of war. Everything that's been taken in these many battles, just to increase the wealth of the Roman Empire, behind those spoils are the slaves. And they're in chains and shackles. And this is Rome's way of beating its chest. This is a majestic, incredible display of strength and power and might. That's how you... When, when, you, when you're a king going to war, you ride a horse. When you are a king of peace, you ride a small donkey. See, Jesus wasn't the kind of king that the Jews were looking for. They wanted a king who would come into Jerusalem and start to smash and break and shatter and, and, and snap the back of oppression of the Roman Empire. They wanted a king that would deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. Jesus wasn't that kind of Messiah. He wasn't that kind of a king. The very fact that he comes in on a donkey is a deliberate attempt to say, I am the Messiah that the prophet Zechariah spoke about. I'm not a king that goes to war. I'm a king that brings peace. Now Luke's gospel tells us that Jesus has with him, as he's made his way to Jerusalem, it seems the crowds have been growing. And so he has a multitude of people with him. John's gospel tells us that there's a multitude of people in Jerusalem who come out to meet him. They're probably the ones who have heard just back in chapter 11. This, chapter 11 to chapter 19 is not a great long length of time. They heard what he did with Lazarus, raising Lazarus from the dead. They've heard about all of his miracles. So a multitude is coming toward Jerusalem, a multitude is coming out of Jerusalem, and, and they meet together. And so you've got these two great multitudes, thousands of people. Had Jesus been a warring king, he would have said, look at the army we have, just the sheer numbers of us. And he would march those people straight toward the Tower of Antonio, which is where the Roman garrison was being housed. That's their headquarters. They would have marched and just by force driven them out of town. He wasn't that kind of a king. In fact, what Jesus does do when he comes into town, he goes to the temple, which shows me that he's not on a military mission. He's on a spiritual mission. It's not about military subjugation as much it is, as it is about the spiritual bondage that people are under. So as these two, rush, these two crowds rush together, all of this excitement, someone gets the grandiose idea to take off his cloak. And he lays it there on the roadway in front of the donkey. Someone is inspired by that. They take off their cloak. Maybe a woman takes off her shawl. I don't know. They start to lay these garments in, in the pathway of the, of the donkey. Mark's gospel tells us that they cut palm branches from the fields and they begin laying the palm branches. So the whole road going in Jerusalem is, is being paved by people's coats and palm branches. It's a very regal gesture because they're acknowledging a king is coming into our city. And they're cheering Jesus' arrival. Look at verse 38. They're shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Sounds a lot like the angels back in Luke chapter 2, doesn't it? This is a quote from Psalms 118 and verse 26. It's part of the Hallel Psalms, Psalms 113 through 18. These were the songs that were sung during festival times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and John 
also add that the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which literally means save us now. It's almost like they're saying, Lord, God, now that you have sent to us the Messiah, now that he is here, now I'm sure they don't fully acknowledge and recognize that he is the Messiah, but they certainly see him as, as a prophet. But now that you've sent us the Messiah, save us now. They don't even understand the implications of their request. That's exactly what God was in the process of doing. Saving people. In closing, let me... And we say closing, we're not two minutes away. We're still a little ways away. <laughs> but in closing, let me share with you something that, that wasn't read when, when Owen read the Scripture to us. Because Luke adds an addendum to offer us some other insight into all that's going on here. The other writers don't mention this. Only Luke. Again, get the theme. Thousands of people, a multitude of people, two groups meet. They're shouting. They're singing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All of this shouting, Hosanna, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. Verse 41. And when he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you and your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. The NIV says you didn't understand the time that God came to you. I think he's talking certainly about what the Romans will do in destroying Jerusalem in A.D. 70. They will utterly destroy the city. There are three things I think Luke points out to us. One is the sheer importance of peace to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a king of peace. He's not a warring lord sitting tall on a horse. He's a peaceful Lord sitting on a donkey. He is the one on the Sermon on the Mount said, Blessed are the peacemakers. He didn't come to fight and squabble and bicker and to defeat and destroy. He came to bring peace. If every one of us would just imitate, emulate the kingly humility of Jesus, we would not struggle near as often as we do. I wouldn't struggle near as often as I do to be a peacemaker. Whenever I find that there's disturbance, whether it's in our nation, and we have a lot of unrest in our nation right now, a lot of division, a lot of upheaval. When I see disturbances in our nation in homes, families, even in a church, you will always find that the problem is someone's ego. Someone's not getting their way. Someone didn't get what they want. Someone doesn't like what they did. It's always about ego. It's always about what I want and what I think is best and what I, I don't like about you. Jesus gave great importance for there to be peace. But whether it's in your home or in this church, you have to set aside your ego if you want there to be peace. Number two, the Pharisees seem to be very offended by the noise of the crowd here. 
All these people, all of this shouting, all of this noise, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. They don't like all the noise. Have you ever been to a quiet parade? It's not much fun, is it? This wouldn't have the near impact on the city and on the people had this been a quiet parade and procession. But see, these religious leaders, they are not offended by the public disturbance of the crowd. They are offended by the public declaration of the people. It's not the noise. It's the words they're using. Blessed is he in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. That's what they're offended by. You see, the people's hearts are filled with joy. The Pharisees' hearts are filled with judgment. And they don't like what they see and what they hear. Because the arrival of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem is going to force their hand for good. Up till this time, they have been meeting behind. Oh, they publicly, uh, they publicly had conflicts with Jesus. They butted heads with Jesus. They always leave with their tail between their legs. But privately, they have been behind closed doors, scheming, conniving, trying to figure out in a way that they can get rid of Jesus without incriminating themselves. That day's over. They cannot privately deal with Jesus anymore. Now, they have to make a decision. They either have to confess him or condemn him. They either have to crown him or crush him. And you know the choice they make. You see, under the circumstances, you would think that Jesus would have come into Jerusalem secretly at night, maybe 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, just come in and and try to avoid being seen by too many people and, and certainly to stay hidden from those enemies that want to destroy him. But Jesus comes in the middle of the day when the sun is high in the air. And by doing this, he not only drew the anger of the religious establishment, but he drew the adulation of the people. But before you think that this is so wonderful, the same voices that are shouting blessed and hosanna, within a week they will be shouting crucify him. Number three. When Jesus neared the city, Luke tells us, he began to cry. He wept. Now, he's not just misty-eyed. He doesn't have a lump in his throat. The word wept literally means to sob out loud. You see, the, the, the impact of the moment, he knows what is ahead of him the, the week that is coming. <laughs> He is carrying a far greater burden than the donkey is carrying. And he weeps. He is sobbing, trying to catch his breath. He is so sad for the city of Jerusalem. I wonder if a company of soldiers, if you know, they've heard, hey, there's this disturbance. There's all these people outside the, the, the gates of the, the city, and, and boy, you ought to, boy, I'm in the crowd, the noise. And so I'm sure a company of soldiers are making their way out to find out what's going on and if there's anything they need to do about it. And they, they arrive on the scene, and they see all of these people. And in the midst of all these people, they see this one grumpy-looking group of men who seem to be unhappy about everything that's going on. But then they see another man on a donkey. And he's weeping. In the Tyndale Commentary series, Leon Morris has a volume on on Luke, and he writes this. There is an ignorance that is innocent. But there's also an ignorance that is culpable. These men, talking about those religious leaders, those Pharisees, these men had the revelation of God and had made known in scriptures of the Old Testament. 
They had the continuing evidence that God was active in the life and ministry of Jesus. They could see him, that God had not forgotten his people. There was every reason for them to have welcomed Jesus as his disciples did. But they refused to accept all of the evidence. They rejected God's Messiah. They would now have to live with the consequences of their rejection. It is this that brought forth Jesus' tears. It always breaks the heart of God when anyone rejects Jesus as Lord and Savior and King. So let me close by asking you a question. How good are you at peacemaking? Now just keep in mind, if you're always having an argument with this person, you're always disagreeing with that person, if they're always miffed about you, about some reason, maybe you're not very good at it. I mean, if you're always in the midst of some squabble with somebody somewhere, maybe you're not that good at it. How good are you at being a peacemaker. Maybe I could ask you the question this way. When it comes to your family, those in your home that know you best, would they describe you as someone who is high atop of a horse, proud and de demanding, always forcing your way? Or do they see you humble? Riding on a donkey. Because those are the peacemakers. And what about in this church? And we don't have a lot, of, a lot of division and squabbles in this church. None that I really know of. But in this church, Ephesians 4, verse 3, do you make every effort to keep the bond of unity in the spirit of peace. The unity of the spirit. Excuse me. In the bond of peace. Is that what you're about? Or do you ever really want your way? And I'm going to speak to the elders about it this time. I mean, do, do you have your agenda? The things that you want to see happen because that's what you want? Now, I'm not saying you can't talk to our elders and make suggestions and recommendations and even critique some things and decisions they make. I'm not saying that. But I am saying, when you look around and you're thinking about the, the harmony and the unity of our, our church family, do you ride a horse or do you ride a donkey? I mean, are you ready to do battle with anybody if that's what it takes? Or are you ready to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? Perhaps this morning, you need to make Jesus King and Lord of your life. Maybe you need the prayers of this church. It may be that you need to confess some sin in your life so that you can rededicate yourself to, to the Lord and to His rule in your life. It may be that you need to confess him as your king and savior and to be immersed in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sin. You know, whatever response you make, whether it's to rededicate your life, to ask for help in the prayers of the church, even to be born again in the waters of baptism, if, you're, if you are to do any of those things, it will require humility on your part. You see, it's pride that keeps you ensconced in the pew and you don't move and you don't speak up and you don't ask and you don't rededicate. Pride keeps you right where you are today. Humility allows God to change your life and to change your heart. And if Jesus Christ is going to be Lord and Savior, He cannot do that unless you also are riding on a donkey as we stand to sing. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. 
How he loves me, how I love him. Noel, thank you not for another wonderful lesson. God is great, isn't he? He is absolutely fantastic. Shall we go to our hymn and a word of prayer? Almighty and wonderful God and Father in heaven, how great is the love that you have lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. This world is in a very precarious state. As Noel has said, where sin is rampant all over. But we know that the reason that the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So brothers, let us not love with just words or tongue, but with actions and truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So help us to believe fully in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has commanded us. Also help us to become soul searchers, winners for you, because we know that there's much work to do in our community, this state, our nation, and the world. So please, Father, be with all the campaigns that are going on even right at this moment and the ones that are to be taking place later on this summer. Please soften the hearts so that a rich harvest may be had for you and your kingdom. Father, thank you so much for coming to this earth, dying for us so that we might have the hope of eternal life. And God, may those that are contemplating becoming Christians know that at any time, 
their friends may take them to the waters of baptism and immerse them in you. It doesn't have to be a big show or anything, but it's always available at this time. And thank you so much, and bless us the remainder of this day. Please be with those that are teaching our classes, help us to speak the word in spirit and in truth. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen.